Hi, I am delighted to be back at Node.js Interactive uh, for the second year. This is always a great conference and a beautiful venue. Uh, before we get started, though, it is extremely important that we take a crowd selfie because if it's not on Instagram, did it even really happen? All right. With that important task done, hello, I am Laurie. Uh, I am the co-founder and COO currently of NPM Inc., but don't take the title too seriously. They had to give me some kind of C title, and that would have to be lying around. Uh, what I really am is a web developer. I've been a web developer for 22 years now, uh, and what I really care about is the web, which is good news for you. Um, today, I'm going to try and give you a sense of what's going on in the world of JavaScript. NPM has a lot of data about what JavaScript developers are up to, um, and I'm going to give you that data. I'm going to give you real usage numbers, not hype. I'm not going to try and sell you on anything. Uh, and what, I want you, what I'm trying to help you do is make decisions uh, about what technical choices you should make in 2019. So there's three parts to this talk. Uh, the first is going to be a quick tour of NPM, especially the newer features that we've introduced. Uh, and second, we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about what NPM knows about you, who you are, what tools you use. Uh, and finally, I'm going to tie those together to make predictions uh, about what we think is going to happen in 2019 to help you make decisions. So stick around to watch me be incredibly wrong about what's going to happen next year. The first thing that you should know about NPM is that NPM is incredibly popular these days. NPM has more than 10 million users, and they download more than 7.6 billion packages every week. Uh, we think something like 90% of developers who use JavaScript are using NPM to do it. Uh, and that number is heading towards 100%. And that's even more amazing because JavaScript is, by some measures, uh, the biggest programming language in the world. It is the biggest programming language on GitHub by a significant margin. 70% uh, of Stack Overflow developers in their survey uh, report that they are using JavaScript, which means that if you do the math on those and you believe those numbers, that's possible that more than 50% of all programmers in the world are using NPM, regardless of what language they work in. Uh, we also went and actually manually checked uh, the 50 websites of the Fortune 50, and all of them are using NPM. We were absolutely sure of that. 50 of the 50 biggest tech companies, 50 of the 50 biggest financial companies. We haven't finished checking every single one of the Fortune 500's websites, but we have not yet found one that doesn't use NPM. Um, fun fact, the websites of major corporations are often astonishingly bad. Uh, my favorite was Berkshire Hathaway, which looks like it was written in 1995 and has never been updated since. It's literally just like an H1 tag, and please don't contact our email. Uh, what all this boils down to, though, is that JavaScript, for better or worse, has become the most important programming language in the world. And that is a strange thing to stand up on stage and say. It's a weird thing. It was not what we were expecting when we were doing form validation in 1997. This was not the plan. Uh, but here we are. So we should start taking JavaScript more seriously than we've been taking it. The next thing is that NPM is being used everywhere JavaScript is being used, and JavaScript is being used everywhere. People are building websites, obviously, uh, but they're also writing server-side apps in Node. Uh, a bunch of people are doing robotics. A bunch of people are doing mobile apps. Um, and all of these people are using NPM packages to do it. So. NPM has become the package manager for all of JavaScript, which again was a surprise. That was not what we were planning. Um, but above all, NPM is for web developers. 93% of the people who are using NPM report that they are using it to do web development, and that is a huge shift in NPM's user base. NPM was written as the node package manager. We were expecting you to be writing server-side applications, and all of these front-end developers showed up and built a bunch of tooling and made it work, and now you're all here. And we're like, OK, well, I guess we have to completely change how we think about ourselves to adapt to the fact that everyone's building websites with this thing that we thought was a server-side tool. 97% um, of the code in a modern web app is downloaded from NPM servers. In fact, by some measures, it's more than that. Sometimes it's 98% or 99%, how you, depending how you measure. But we stopped using 99% because it just sounds like we made it up, like 97%. Uh, but it means that you, the, la the app developer, are responsible for only the last 3% of the code in your web app. So let's talk about NPM a bit. 
Uh, the current version of NPM is six. If you are in version three or four, which something like 40% of you are, then you are woefully behind the times and it is time to upgrade. NPM six is 20 times faster than NPM four was, which by itself should be enough reason to upgrade. Um, and I said it was faster, which means that somebody in the audience is gonna ask, is it faster than Yarn? Um, yes, it is faster than Yarn, or more accurately, all the package managers are about the same speed now because what happened was open source working the way that open source is supposed to work. All of the package managers from PNPM and Yarn and NPM and all of the other ones, they got together in a community, they started sharing ideas with each other, they started sharing code with each other, and the result was that all of the package managers in the last two years have got a lot faster, but now they're all roughly the same speed because they're all doing roughly the same fast things. So. Part of how that speed came about is to do with the biggest recent change in NPM, uh, which is that NPM locks by default. When you do an NPM install, you get a package lock JSON, uh, which means that what you have on your development box is exactly what you get in production. This was a change that we had to make to deal with the size of trees in a web development world. In a server-side app, you have maybe 10 or 20 modules, but in a web app, like a thousand modules is a standard tree size now, and the chances of there being no semver drift in a tree of a thousand modules is nil. So you need a package lock. You have to lock everything down. Um, NPM 6 also introduces NPM CI. Uh, this is an alternative way of calling NPM install intended to be used in continuous integration environments. Uh, continuous in integration environments, they have a couple of predictable features, like we know that the cache is gonna be empty, we know there's gonna be no node modules folder, uh, and it means that we can dispense with a bunch of work, uh, and the result is that NPM CI is twice as fast as an ordinary install. So if you are running NPM in your uh, continuous integration environment, replace the NPM install command with the NPM CI command, and it will run twice as fast, and nothing else will change. Ta-da! Uh, as NPM has got bigger, security has become an even bigger concern for us. Um, Earlier this year, NPM acquired Lyft Security, which was also another new thing for us. We've never acquired anybody before. Um, and the first thing that we did was we incorporated the Node Security project directly into NPM itself, and this resulted in several new features. Uh, the first is that um, is two-factor auth. Two-factor auth is important for everyone, but it's especially important for package authors. If you publish a package, you can require that it must be published with two-factor auth. This makes it much harder for somebody to steal your credentials and publish malicious code while pretending to be you. Uh, in May, we also launched NPM Quick Audits. Uh, you've probably already seen them because they run every time you run NPM install. Uh, whenever you download any packages from NPM, we will alert you if any of the packages that you've just downloaded have known security vulnerabilities. This works in nearly every version of NPM, and it's especially good in NPM 6, where we've added a bunch of extra logic to make it display these warnings with a lot of detail. We do around four million of these quick audits every week right now, um, and the stats that we're getting from them are pretty alarming. Uh, something like 11% of the scans that we run contain a critical vulnerability. That's like a, you know, you should, you know, hit the big red button and stop everything and fix that thing. And it's in 11% of the installs right now. So we have a lot of work to do in the JavaScript community. But the good news is that uh, indications are that the, just the existence of NPM audit, just the existence of this little message saying, hey, you've got some insecure stuff, is making people get more secure. Running NPM audit will give you detailed reports of the vulnerabilities in your app, how severe they are, and what to do about them. And this is an interesting thing because usually what to do about them is just upgrade the version of the package that you've got to a version where it's been fixed, which means that most of the time NPM's audits NPM audit's advice is, hey, you should run NPM. And if NPM is advising you to run NPM, why doesn't NPM just run NPM and be done with it? Uh, and that's exactly what we did. So if you run NPM audit fix, uh, NPM will follow its own advice. Uh, and whenever it can safely do so, it will upgrade your software for you to the safest version available. If you run it just by itself, it will only pick SEMVR, uh, SEMVR compatible uh, upgrades, but if you run it with dash dash force, uh, it will bring in breaking changes as well if th that's what's necessary to make your software safe. Obviously, NPM has not solved the halting problem and invented a magical piece of software that can write your software for you. You still have to run your tests and make sure that after we've upgraded your software for you that everything still works. Uh, but NPM Audit Fix takes an enormous amount of grunt work out of keeping your software secure, which is important because, like I said, a thousand modules in every tree. 
And this brings me briefly back to Yarn. We used to say that we don't care which, pe which client people use uh, to access the registry. They're all accessing the NPM, NPM registry, so we don't mind. But we can no longer say that with a straight face. Um, NPM caught up to Yarn in terms of speed, but with the addition of two-factor auth and NPM audit, NPM is just a lot safer to use than Yarn. Um, and for that reason, we recommend people use NPM. Uh, that's not a huge shocker. NPM recommends you use NPM, like Film at 11. Uh, these links are a blog post from a company that switched to Yarn and then back to NPM. Uh, and that second link is a tool that they use to do a migration from a Yarn project to an NPM project. And the last thing to know about NPM, which I keep including because people keep asking, after five years of being a company, people are like, NPM is a company? Yes. Fuck yes. We are a company. <laughs> we are not a charity. We make money, and the money is used to keep the registry running. The registry costs millions of dollars a year just for bandwidth and servers, and that is before any of the people get hired, and there are a lot of people involved. So we make that money by selling services that NPM users love, services like private packages and security services. But enough about those things for now. On to what NPM knows about you. First off, how do we know all of this stuff? There are two main sources. The first is the registry itself. You are all constantly downloading software from the registry, so we know what software is getting more popular and what software is getting less popular. And the second source of data is we just asked you. We ran a survey of 16,000 NPM users, and you just told us outright what it is that you're up to, and the results have been absolutely fascinating. But first, I want to try a party trick, and I have no idea if it will work with this audience. Uh, so I'd like to ask everybody to stand up. And if you can't stand up, just raise a hand. Uh, and I'm going to make a statement about you. And I want you to sit down again if that statement is not true. So stay standing if you use NPM. Good. Stay standing if you write JavaScript for browsers. If you write JavaScript at work. If you're concerned that maybe the open source you use is not totally secure or might become insecure, these are all pretty easy. You mostly taught yourself JavaScript. Now it's going to get tricky. In addition to JavaScript, you write PHP or Java sometimes. Still a bunch of you. You work at a company that isn't really considered a tech company. You started using NPM less than two years ago. Still a lot of you. Can we go further? Uh, you're using Webpack and Babel. And you're writing a React app <laughs> using TypeScript. I've got you. There you are. So we know an awful lot about you. Uh, but we went back, we went through that all pretty quickly, so let's go and explore a couple of those. Uh, the first thing to dig into is that NPM users aren't only writing JavaScript. This was kind of a surprise, but it shouldn't really have been. 30% um, of you are either writing uh, PHP or Java or Python. C Sharp is also fairly popular. Uh, Go, C++, and Ruby are in there. Um, Many NPM users don't consider themselves JavaScript users at all. They consider themselves some other primary language, and they just use NPM to get the website done. Um, that was a surprise, but it probably shouldn't have been. Uh, there's a wonderful paper that I cite all the time by a guy called Leo Meyerovich at UC Berkeley. He did a PhD about what makes people pick a programming language. Is it the language features? Is it the efficiency? Is it that other people at the company already know that language? Uh, but what he discovered is that the dominant thing that makes you pick a programming language is the availability of open source libraries that help you get the immediate task at hand done. Over and above any other feature, if there's a library that does what you need to get done, that's the programming language that you pick. Uh, and that's funny because that's exactly what you said when we ran our survey. The libraries available are why people pick JavaScript. And another way of putting that is people pick JavaScript because of the libraries in the NPM registry. There are a bunch of other reasons that people said that they picked JavaScript, including a sad 15% who said that they didn't get a choice in their programming language. <laughs> Interestingly, if you do a breakout, those users are mostly Ruby users. Uh, Another important, fi important finding from the survey was how big a concern to most users the security of their open source code was. Um, 
77% of people say they're concerned about security. Even more of a problem is that 52% of you, at least in January, said that the current tools available are not good enough for telling whether or not your code is secure. Um, I talked about all of the security features we've added this year, and this is the data that made us do that. We looked at that and said, that's not good enough. So we like acquired a whole company and built a whole bunch of features to fix that problem. So now would be a good time to mention NPM Enterprise. If you're a big company and you're worried about the security of your JavaScript, first off, good idea. It's scary out there. Um, and secondly, we can help you with that. NPM's Enterprise Service will give you your own registry domain uh, that will let you, your company control what JavaScript makes it into your network um, and give you security alerts plus a ton of other great security features. I said that we should start taking JavaScript seriously, and this is part of what I mean by that. So. That's part two. That's a little bit about who we NPM users are. But what I promised you was information to help you make technical choices in 2019. And for that, we need to look at the tools you're using right now and what's happening to them. The thing about developers is that they get really passionate about their tools. And when I give these stats, they get really aggressively passionate, let's say, about the tools that they're using. When I tell them that a tool that they like is unpopular, they tend to get really defensive and yell at me about my methodology and make you know, assertions about my mother. Um, <laughs> I don't have a dog in this fight. These are just the numbers that we see. I'm not saying that your framework is bad. I'm just talking about its relative popularity. If you want me to tell you that your framework is, is bad, that is what the after party is for. So before I show you these angry making graphs, let's put this all in context. I want you to fix this in your mind. This is how the registry grows. The registry has grown 18,000% since 2014. Uh, and it is very, very hard to wrap your mind around that kind of growth. That's why, that's why half of you have only been using NPM for the last two years, because the registry is so much bigger than it used to be that everyone's basically brand new. And what that means is that every package is constantly acquiring new users. Because there's just so many new users. Even the shittiest package is constantly acquiring new users because all these newbies keep showing up and going, I don't know what's going on. I'll just use this like evil package one. Uh, so that line at the top of the graph in blue, that's Express. Express is bedrock to the NPM registry. Everybody uses Express for something. Uh, and here is the metric we use. It's called share of registry. This blue line is expressed using the share of registry metric. This is, not a share, this is not a metric of how absolutely popular Express is. Express is going up and to the right in absolute terms. This is a, as a share of registry. It's how relatively popular it is relative to everything else in the registry. And what it's doing relative to everything else in the registry is it's staying flat. So keep this metric in mind. If you see a flat line, that means 18,000% growth. If you see anything going up and to the right with this metric, it's doing better than that. So let's take a look at front-end frameworks first, uh, starting with the very oldest one, which is Backbone. As you can see, back in 2013, Backbone was the shit. Everyone was using it. Uh, it was almost as popular as Express. And now basically nobody uses Backbone, or rather about 250,000 downloads a week are using Backbone, right? That's what a collapse in popularity looks like. Uh, and the thing that you can see in the, in the life of Backbone clearer than in any of these other numbers is the pattern of how a framework dies. Very few people switch frameworks in the middle of a project. They don't start using a project and then change the whole thing to a new framework. They maintain the project in the framework that it started in, but they start new projects in some other new framework. So no framework has popularity that falls off a cliff. They all have this sort of half-life, this slow decline uh, to a flat line. So lots of people are maintaining existing backbone projects, even though nobody is writing a new one. So now let's look at React. React is going sharply up and to the right using this metric. React is goddamn running away with the web. 60% uh, of the respondents in our survey said that they were using React for something. 60% of everybody, 60% of 10 million people say that they are using React to build something. That is huge usage and impressive growth, but it's no longer runaway growth. You'll see that it's sort of flattening out now. Uh, is that temporary? We're going to look at that in a little bit. Angular is an extremely popular framework. In our survey in January, about 40% of users said that they are using Angular. Uh, so about two-thirds as many as use React. 
Um, our downloads data says something a little bit different. It says only about half as many use Angular as use React. Uh, there are a bunch of reasons that, that those two numbers could be a little bit different, and the Angular community was very, very willing to tell me what they might be, not always politely. Uh, so I'm not going to say that Angular is getting less popular. I definitely don't have enough data to say that. What I will say is that Angular's, downlo Angular's downloads uh, peaked in 2017 and have been slowly declining since then, and there could be any number of reasons that that's happening. Ember is an unusual story. Uh, I've never seen this with a framework before. Ember peaked in popularity in 2015 and then began a familiar slow decline, but in 2016, it turned around, uh, which I've never seen happen before. Ember is now seeing really healthy growth. Uh, in January, about 4% of NPM users reported using Ember, and now something like twice or three times that many people are using Ember. Uh, roughly as popular as Ember right now is Vue, but Vue has a very different growth story, which is that Vue is just taking off up and to the right. Um, if I had to guess why React's growth is slowing down right now, I would say it is because a lot of new users are investigating Vue. Some of them are probably going to Ember, but I think a bunch of them are going to Vue. I don't have a perfect picture. There are a zillion other frameworks that could be contributing to the slowdown in React, but that's my guess so far. I want to dig a little bit deeper into the React ecosystem, partly because so many of you are using it, and partly because it's unique. Uh, React isn't really a framework. React is a very, very well-designed solution to one part of the problems of a web app. Namely, React is a way of making components that share state. There are lots of types of apps where that's useful. Rich web apps are obviously one of them. Uh, but mobile apps and desktop apps also have that feature, and so a lot of people are building those things using React. Um, rich web apps, in addition to needing state, they also have another requirement, which is they need to be able to map URLs to state. And to do that, a lot of people are using React Router. As you can see, React Router took off and has sort of leveled off in the same way that React has. Uh, but the interesting thing is that it leveled off at about half the popularity of React itself. And this is one of the triumphs of React and why it's so popular, because the designers of React successfully managed to decouple this very good solution to one problem from web apps as a domain. Every framework that I was aware of prior to React built everything for itself. It built its own component model, its own router, its own data model, its own everything, and glued them all together and made you use them all as a group. And React just said, we've figured this one thing out, and everything else, you need to pick your own. Um, and that flexibility is what fuels React's popularity. React itself is more than twice as popular as React Router. And that's because there are a lot of React apps that don't use React Router. And there are a lot of React apps that don't need React Router because they're desktop apps. Um, speaking of React's decoupled model, another great example of this is Flux. Flux was released by Facebook at roughly the same time as React itself. And Flux was sort of how Facebook was expecting you to handle the problem of uh, managing data models in large, uh, managing the data model of a large application. Um, and as you can see, that hasn't happened at all. Uh, Flux peaked in 2015 and has been falling since then. Um, imagine if Facebook had coupled these two together. Imagine if Facebook and Flux, uh, if React and Flux had been stapled together, the unpopularity of Flux would have pulled React down with it. Instead, what happened is React took off, and people use Redux to manage state instead. As you can see, Flux's downturn in popularity started the very moment that Redux was available. Uh, and now Redux and React Router track each other uh, because they're an extremely popular combination. I mentioned GraphQL in passing earlier. GraphQL started in React land uh, and has expanded beyond it, and it is red hot right now. There have been a couple talks about it. Um, there are two big libraries for using GraphQL. One is Apollo and the other one is Relay. But as you can see, Apollo is just running away with it. Apollo is the thing that everybody uses to do GraphQL. I've spent a lot of time focused on front end so far because, as I said, that's what most of you are doing. Um, but 70% of you are also doing back end applications. So uh, let's take a look at those. Uh, what people, the answer is Express. Everyone uses Express. If you put Express on a graph with all of the other frameworks, none of the other frameworks even show up. Uh, so let's take Express out of the graph and see what we see. Um, in blue is Koa. Koa is a sort of spiritual successor to Express. Koa's relative popularity is pretty flat, but remember, this is the registry, so a flat line means 18,000% growth. Koa is doing just nicely, thank you. Um, 
Sails, as the name suggests, is a straight up port of Ruby on Rails uh, to Node, and as the graph suggests, that seemed like a good idea at the time. Happy is a framework that NPM used to use on our own website. We uh, switched earlier this year to using React for it. Um, Happy's relative growth is also flat. So again, 18,000% growth. Happy is doing just fine. Uh, and the last one I want to mention is Next.js from Zite. Um, Next.js is a sort of kitchen, kitchen sink, everything included framework uh, that uses React. So if you want to try out React or you like React and you don't want to have to do all of the choices about what router and what data model and what all of the stuff do I use, uh, you can just get kicked off with Next. Um, I like it a lot for that reason. Uh, and it is growing in absolute terms really, really fast. So how is everyone doing so far? Are we enjoying this talk? <laughs> For the next part, I'm going to split you up right down the middle. Everybody on this side of the line is Team A. Everybody on this side of the line is Team B. Hear it from Team A. Woo! Team B. Woo! Team A again. Woo! Team B again. Woo! I'm not going to use that for anything. That was just to wake you up after 20 minutes of graphs. Uh, so. We've talked a ton about frameworks, um, but a big part of what people use NPM for is to help with their build chain and their tooling. Like everything else, we have some fascinating data here, and the first of which is that people want less tooling. In fact, they hate tooling. Anytime I ask them anything about tooling, a whole bunch of like free text answers show up going, I wish I didn't have to use any of this shit. Uh, so if we can do anything with tooling, it is get rid of it. But what tools are we using? Well, 85% of us use web frameworks. That's no surprise. What is surprising is that that's compared to the 93% of us who are doing web apps. So that means that 8% of us are rolling our own, which is not a good idea. 74% uh, of us are using transpilers. 69% are using linters. 67% are using bundlers. And 80% of those are using Webpack. 58% uh, are using CSS processors. And 58% are using testing frameworks. So let's dig a bit more into these. Transpilers are tools that translate other languages into JavaScript. Um, the most popular one is, of course, Babel. Uh, and the reason it's so popular is because it's part of React, or it's closely associated with React. Um, mostly, transpilers are translating JavaScript into other kinds of JavaScript. But JSX, which is part of React, is not really JavaScript at all. But it gets translated into JavaScript for you. But it's such a popular part of the JavaScript ecosystem now that it's beginning to seem that like JSX should become part of JavaScript at this point. Like if everyone's using it and everyone is writing React apps and everyone is expecting JSX to work, it seems like we should get over ourselves and put JSX into JavaScript. Um, CoffeeScript is still clinging on in there. Elm and ClojureScript are in there. But the big surprise is TypeScript. 46% of people who use NPM report that they are using TypeScript for something, which is very surprising to 54% you know, of us. Um, <laughs> TypeScript is mostly JavaScript. Uh, it just adds types, which are really just a form of built-in testing. It's a pretty good idea. It helps large teams work better together. Uh, Microsoft launched TypeScript with its own uh, package manager, but in TypeScript 2, uh, they switched to NPM because the TypeScript community hated having to use two separate package managers. Um, so Microsoft switched to NPM, and they, uh, which is great and very you know, new Microsoft of them to use somebody else's tool. Uh, and they did it without asking us if that would be OK, which was very old Microsoft of them. Um, Linters, as 70% of you know, are tools that will tell you if your code is nice, and it will check for obvious errors. Uh, it'll flag or even correct coding style problems for you. They are super popular, and by far the most popular is ESLint, and therein lies a tale. Uh, you may have heard about ESLint this year because there was a big security incident involving ESLint relatively recently. ESLint, like most open source projects, is maintained by a bunch of very experienced developers who mostly know what they're doing when it comes to security. Unfortunately, one of the developers on the ESLint project was being a little lazy. Everybody else had enabled 2FA except this one guy. And to make matters worse, he had used the same password that he had used on some other website. That other website got its password stolen. And somebody found that out, stole that password, and got access to his NPM account. Long story short, they published a version of ESLint that, when installed, it would try to steal your NPM login token. 
this could have been a disaster. The, the attacker could have stolen the tokens of the people who'd been compromised, use it to publish new versions of new malicious packages. It could have created an exponential effect. It could have been a disaster. Uh, but what actually happened is people noticed really quickly because there are 10 million of you and you're all developers, so you're pretty fast at noticing when something strange is happening. Um, so within 30 minutes of people noticing, uh, we had taken the package down and we had put a security notice into NPM audit so everyone who was using NPM 6 was getting notices going, don't use this thing. Um, and then we reset the, the login tokens of every single NPM user to make sure that even if somebody's token, uh, token had been stolen, it couldn't be used. Uh, and as far as we can tell, this has worked. It has been a couple of months and nobody else has had their account compromised as a result. But this is why we're taking NPM security so seriously. With 10 million users, the tiny percentage of bad people is also a very large absolute number of people. So you should be using 2FA. It is now impossible to, it is now possible to enforce 2FA on a package. So the problem that ESLint had is no longer possible. They can just say anybody who has access to ESLint must publish it using 2FA. Um, uh, and obviously you should be using NPM6 because NPM6 will warn you if you are using anything that has been compromised. And then again, this is another part of what I mean by taking JavaScript more seriously than we've done until now. So now back to our tooling stats. Uh, looking at testing frameworks, a great deal of you are using Mocha. Jasmine is also very popular. Um, Jest is understandably popular given its ties to the React community, but sitting up there at number three is none. 21% of you are doing no testing at all, apparently. Uh, surely we can do better than that, folks. Um, actually, that brings up something interesting because you can do better than that, and the data says that you will. We first noticed this effect when we were building our security features, and we looked into how uh, developers approach security and split them up by the amount of experience that they have. So those people uh, on the left have less than one year of experience and the people on the right have 10 plus years of experience and we discovered this great linear progression. The more experienced you are, the more seriously you take security. We discovered that this, true, this was true with nearly everything that we would consider a best practice. So these bars are just the least experienced people against the most experienced people for a whole bunch of practices. So using a testing framework, using a linter, performing code reviews, having code audits, using automated scans for security, everything that's a best practice, you do it more, the more experienced you get. So that's good news. In security in particular, we observed this effect. In the least experienced group, only 58% of devs use security tools at all. Uh, but in the most experienced group, it's 85%. And the good news is that you can get into the 85% group by just upgrading to NPM6. Suddenly, you're doing automated scans. So. Now we come to the future of JavaScript. This is the part that I promised where I would make bad predictions and you can take pictures of me standing in front of bad predictions so that when they turn out to be bad, you can show the picture and I look like an idiot. The biggest prediction I can make and the most likely to be accurate is that nothing lasts forever. Uh, Backbone, which was once dominant, is now an afterthought. jQuery, which gave web development so much power and flexibility, well, it didn't really die, it sort of transcended. The APIs that are part of jQuery are just now part of browsers, so nobody has to use jQuery anymore. Um, but most frameworks have a tool, have a lifetime measured in a handful of years, and then this long lingering afterlife as people slowly migrate away from them. So don't cling too tightly to your tools. But on the front end side right now, if I had to pick a framework, I would pick React. It would be unwise to bet against it, at least for the next few years. Uh, React has a ton of users, but possibly more importantly, React has a ton of existing modules. And the reason that's important is because of that study I was talking about earlier. You can use a React module in a bunch of places. You can reuse the code. If React developers create enough reusable React modules, React will uh, sort of develop a gravity well of reusable code that will pe keep people on React forever. If React becomes really reusable, if everybody starts using React as the pool of things that you use to build a website, then React could just hang around forever. Um, being able to NPM install uh, like React Color, which is, an, which is a widget that just creates a color picker for you on your website without you having to do anything, it just works perfectly in any React app that you drop it into, that is the dream, my friends. We have been trying to do that for years. It is like jQuery plugins that actually work. Uh, 
Will React become the, the library of all web UI? It is too soon to tell. I'm not making that prediction. Maybe web components will do it, but the signs are not good right now, but I'm not predicting right now. Um, and part of that is we've already seen React slow down a little bit. Um, it could be that Vue is doing that. Vue has a lot of momentum. Or it could just be that React, while extremely flexible and extremely powerful, is not flexible enough to cover 100% of web development use cases. It could be that it's just not possible for a single framework to match the entire diversity of all of the things that we need to do on the web. That's a safe guess, but it's not a super useful one. So I say use React. React has the users, and that is a big deal when it comes to picking a framework, because those people will answer your questions, they will write your tutorials for you, they will find and fix the bugs before you even get to them, and they will answer your questions on Stack Overflow. In 2019, if you are looking for something new to learn and really wrap your head around, that thing should probably be GraphQL. GraphQL is about to be huge. There are whole startups built around it event, uh, already. There's a ton of hype gathering around it. Uh, the tooling is getting better, and it has some real advantages. If you build APIs, it is worth investigating if GraphQL will help you do that better. When it comes to bundling, transpiling, and linting, all I can safely predict is that you're going to keep doing those for quite some time. Um, the data says that as you gain experience, you're even more likely to do them. Um, Webpack has 80% of bundling, and that seems to be a safe bet for a while. ESLint will almost certainly stay the most popular linter, despite that little security hiccup. Uh, and Babel will remain the transpiler of choice. But don't forget about TypeScript. I am still surprised about TypeScript, and I've been staring at this data all year. Um, the biggest prediction of this talk may be that you'll stop writing JavaScript and switch to TypeScript instead. And an interesting question that falls out of that is what happens to NPM if people stop writing JavaScript? And the answer is nothing. And the way that I know is because that already happened, and you didn't notice. A big percentage of the modules on NPM have native code in them. You use them, uh, and they just compile themselves, and they work perfectly in your JavaScript, and you don't even notice that it's happening. React isn't written in any form of browser-compatible JavaScript. It's written in a thing that looks kind of like ES6, but it has the import semantics of Babel. React is written in an imaginary version of JavaScript that doesn't exist anywhere, and you didn't notice. Uh, so it's probably not going to be a problem. Um, one of the most exciting developments on this front of not JavaScript uh, is WASM. That's WebAssembly to you and me. Um, WebAssembly lets you write in any language, even compiled languages like C and Rust and everything else, uh, and turn it into a form of JavaScript that runs as fast as native code, but it runs in your browser. This is a really, really interesting development um, because it provides a way to give web apps native-like performance, even for really computationally expensive tasks. And the best part is that it's already here. Wasm Pack is a tool from Mozilla that lets you write code in Rust, compile it down, and run it inside of your browser. And then you can publish it to NPM, just like any other NPM package. In fact, a bunch of people have already done that. And some of you may already be running Wasm without knowing that it's in your stack, because it's just transparently there. It's just more JavaScript. And this brings up something even more interesting, because we talked about all this tooling and how people hate the tooling. And I mentioned the popularity of TypeScript, which isn't really JavaScript. And then I talked about WASM, which lets you write any language. And that begs the question, if you have to transpile everything anyway, why would you even pick JavaScript in the first place? If it's not really JavaScript, why start with a different version of JavaScript? Um, the Node.js and JS foundations are considering a merger, and that's a great first step. But the bigger problem is that the NPM registry is full of 800,000 modules written in CommonJS, and CommonJS doesn't work in a browser. You have to transpile it. Um, and of course they should, because the browser is where 93% of you are. We're all writing JavaScript that's meant for Node, and then running it in browsers, and acting like having this huge pile of tooling in the middle is just like the way forward. It shouldn't work like that. That's not the way that we should do it. Node.js and browser, ma browser manufacturers should collaborate, put ego aside, and fix this problem so we don't have to use all of this pain in the ass tooling anymore. Because if they don't, people will abandon JavaScript. JavaScript's strength has always been that it's easy to use. Node's huge advantage was that it was fast and simple to get going, and a mess of transpilation and tooling is going to eliminate that risk, is going to eliminate that advantage. If we don't get this right, JavaScript's future is at risk. And this brings me to my other big prediction, which is that no matter what happens, NPM is here to stay. Whether JavaScript stays big or we all end up writing web apps in Rust, 
whatever happens, this huge pile of delicious, delicious libraries, these 800,000 libraries that are the reason that we use JavaScript, they're going to stay around no matter what language they happen to be written in. So NPM, one, one day it might not be JavaScript, but it will still be the way you put a web app together. I've been doing web development now, like I said, for 22 years, and it has always thrilled me. And that is no time, at no time has that been uh, more true than now. The stuff that we can do on the web is amazing, and it's wonderful, and it's scary. And the tools that we use to make it are ad hoc and partially broken and kind of a mess. Uh, and my final and biggest prediction is that's how it's always going to be. We are never going to finish doing this. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be completely sorted out. It's always going to have that under construction gift going on because that's how you can tell that the web is growing. That's how you can tell that the web isn't static and abandoned. It's because we're constantly reinventing it. These challenges that I've been talking about, the challenges we face together, we can fix this. And I believe that we will. And that is the thing that makes the web so exciting. So I hope you stick around for the next 22 years. And thank you very much. Me is on Twitter. Um, come and ask me if you have any questions after the talk. Uh, we have a lot of socks to give away at our booth. We have a bunch of stickers to give away at our booth. We will have puppies to pet at our booth tomorrow. Uh, and if you want to hear more from NPM, my colleague Adam Baldwin is giving talk about threat modeling tomorrow at 2 p.m. Thanks again. <laughs>